We want to look now, we're starting on lesson four, being the student of God's Word. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 34, Sam. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, Sandy. Hebrews 11.25, Jim. George, Psalm 40, verse 8. Psalm I always, 40. Do, always do you that way, don't I? Psalm, Psalm 40, verse 8. Verse 8. Joe, Matthew 6, 24. And Ecclesiastes. Scott, Matthew 4. Now, I don't know how far we're going to get, but we'll stop right there for the time being. But I'm going to need a few readers. Uh, verses 33 through 35. Joe. Uh, avoid temporary preoccupation, verses 36 and 37. Who wants to read it? Sam, okay. All right. Where did I? Oh, okay. 38 and 40. Who wants that? Scott. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question before I begin. <clears throat> Sam, you got a conscience? Yes. Sandy, you got a conscience? Yes. Jimmy, you got a conscience? Jim? Yes. George? Yes. Scott? Yes. And? Chuck? Yes, sir. And I do. Where did it come from? No. Wow. Pardon me? Comes from your heart, don't no. Your heart's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Here's, here's what you must realize. Adam and Eve, when God created them, they had no conscience. None. They were innocent. But when they sinned, and God come looking for Adam, and he asked the question, what did he ask? Who told you you were naked, and why did Adam hide? Because he had a conscience of guilt. How did that occur? From the sin, the fall. If you and I... God never intended us to have a conscience. Now, if you eat from the tree of what? No, not the tree of life. The one that Eve ate from, what is it? That is exactly where they got their conscience. That's why God didn't want them to eat from it. Because he knew that the sin would kill them and it would also provoke them to do a lot of searching. Some of it good, some of it bad, but mostly was not supposed to be. You and I must realize that our conscience was not something from the Lord. It came from the fall, the sin, from that tree that God told them not to eat from. You got that? You put these in little things in your heart and mind. So now we'll go on. But I wanted to share that with you. I was going to share it with you this, this past Sunday, but, uh, you know, Lord forbid that I could be here. But let's begin. <clears throat> Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem using the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 stanzas with eight verses each. This lesson will examine the fifth stanza which is headed by the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, E. This section rhythmically reminds us of importance 
of being good students of God's word. We will see at least three things to do as we study our Bible first is to pray for illumination. Now first, before Joe reads that, what's illumination? Well, if you've ever been in a, in a place, uh, the illumination is this, where you at right now, this room, when I came in, I turned the lights on, what did I do? Illuminate. Illuminate. Okay, so get in your mind what the illumination is. It means the lights on. Okay, Joe. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Does it give you joy to read the Word of God? I mean, think about this. You know, I got in there and I was reading about Joshua, about how they were defeated at Ai. And you have to read the seventh and eighth chapters to really get an understanding of what God was intending to do. So, I mean, I sat there and I was there. I mean, that's the kind of joy I have in reading the Word of God. It it's illuminates in my mind that puts me away from this world into a world in the past, but it's through God's word to learn from. So it was illumination. Now, Paul, now I'm going to show you a little something here. Paul and Jesus had a good beginning and a good end. Now, let me say this to you. Uh, not everybody has a good ending. They, get a, they might have a good beginning, but they don't have a good ending. And the Apostle Paul warns us that we need to have a good ending. Lot, he had a very good beginning, but he didn't have a good ending. Samson, Samson had a great beginning, but he had a real bad ending. King Saul, he had a great beginning being the first king of Israel. And he wasn't taking God's place, but the people chose for him to. Had a great beginning, but he had a bad ending. And I want Joe, since he started reading this, the psalmist wants everybody here to end well. Look at verse 33. And he's talking about ending well is the consequence of living well. You think about, and before Joe reads that verse 33, you listen to me carefully. Basically, you've had people in this church and in your life that had a great beginning with their relationship to God. But at the very end of their life, you find that they had a bad ending. They was out of church. They were unchurched. They no longer read the Word of God. Had a poor prayer life. And it's because of one reason. And I can assure you that you can search through your mind and remember who I'm talking about because it's many people that you might know or it's a few that you might know or it may be just one that you know. But the key is if you're going to begin well and end well, you must live well. And you can only do that by verse 33. Read it, Job. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. There you go. <laughs> Teach me, O Lord, <laughs> your statutes. Teach me your way. Teach me. Do you know what I pray every day? Lord, <laughs> I can't do it. You got to do it for me today. You got to guide me. You got to direct me. Everything that I'm doing today, let me glorify you. I, I need you because if you don't, I'm going to fall off the train track really fast. And only you can keep me on track. So verse 33 is telling you that if you begin well, but you don't end well, it's because you didn't live well. It's because you didn't follow 
God's instructions. And these are very important points in our life. And so many people, and let me say this to you, I'm talking about there's preachers. There's nobody that's void of this, that inoculated by some kind of power for it not to fall upon them. But stop and think about people even that you know, but you didn't know them. You, you knew they were famous or a famous preacher or whatever, and they failed. Because they began well, but they didn't end well because they didn't live well. And by the way, you cannot live well without God. You cannot live well making your own decisions. You must ask God for guidance every single day. That's what verse 33 is telling you. So what are the essentials for a life that ends well? Learning, obeying, delighting, fearing, longing for God's truth. Those are five facts that we need to understand. Illumination is the process of, of uh, shining light to make something visible or understandable. God wants all people to hear and understand his word. This is why Christians start schools everywhere that they take the gospel. So this is also why missionaries give their lives to translate the Bible into other languages. Christians realize basic education is fundamental for people to understand the Bible. In fact, the first universities in the United States were established to educate Christian ministers. Can any of you tell me what schools they were? Brother Ivy League, Princeton, Harvard, and all of these Ivy League schools were established for ministers. Godly schools. Now they're about as ungodly as you can get. They started well, but today they're not going to end well. See, when Satan begins to see the things of God and they're good, he becomes a part of it. Just like our Bible study. If you, if you think we're doing good, I can guarantee you that Satan is going to try everything that he can to stop you from learning and understanding things that you need to apply to your life. The same as it is with me. So we have to see here that those schools were starting good, but they haven't ended good. Now, when applying for admission into a university, you may have to answer this question. Why do you want to attend our university? In verses 33 through 35, the psalmist tells us why he wants, ad he wants admission into God's school. Why does he want to learn God's law according to verse 34? Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. You know, we must pray for spiritual illumination so we can learn God's way and God's character. Just as children learn the character of their parents <laughs> and what pleases them, so we must know God better and discern His. Let me say this to you. Now, not all of you in here are parents, but I make this point to you. I know what it took to please my daddy. Now, notice I say daddy. The Bible says, call no one father except the father above. I knew how to please my daddy. I'll ask you a question. Oh, we'll put Scott on the, on the carpet. Do you know how to please your daddy? Yep. Okay. Jim, did you know how to please your daddy? Yeah. It was even, even though your situation was not unique, it was, it was tough. George, you know how to please your daddy? And, and you see, Ken, you know how to please your daddy? Well, this is the key. 
This is a key, just like I knew how to please my daddy. Now, what, now you have to, this is something for you to really learn here. My Father in heaven, I take this psalm, I've got to learn his character so I know how to please him. Now, one of the things is, is we've been taught since we were children about don't do this, God doesn't like that. Well, God is my Father. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure that the things that I have learned and a lot I have not, that I must not do because it's not pleasing to my Father. And instead of the things that don't please Him, I want to put in my life more things that please Him that my Father will bless me, protect me, supply me, and take care of me and everything. Do you know why a lot of times it's not so easy for some people? It's because they don't please their father. I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but I got to use Troy. Troy still hates his dad because he said, why did God give me such a rotten daddy that beat me and beat me for no reason but just to beat me? And I said, I can't answer that. I never knew your dad, and I never knew anything about him. Well, that's what he enjoyed was beating me. And I said, I hate him. I can't love him. I said, well, you got to forgive him and go on. No, I don't want to forgive him because I, I hate him. That's Troy. You're not pleasing the Father God when you're doing something for yourself. I'm not doing nothing for myself. Oh, yeah, you are. You're hating your father. Are you getting my point? You say, ha, I'm going to do this. And God says, I don't want you to do that. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, we see children that way in a lot of families that would just absolutely just take upon themselves that they're going to do it their way and they're going to do it. If not, they're just going to pound on the floor and scream and yell and everything, knock their food off the table, do all kinds. Well, my friend, what I'm trying to tell you is that's no way to please your father. So a lot of times we make decisions. Now, again, oh, why did that preacher ask me if I had a conscience? <laughs> well, my friend, does your conscience bother you when you don't please the Father? Knowing what you've done, you did intentionally. You were doing it to please yourself and to please your conscience. Your conscience is a sinner. Your conscience wants you to do good and bad and a lot of things that you're doing bad, your conscience makes you think you've done good. You become a critic and you say, hey, I warned them people about that person. And you say, boy, didn't I do good? No, you did bad. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? And that in no manner is pleasing the Father. Because you know something? His beloved son died for that person as well as he died for you. The second thing is, did God tell you that it's okay for you to be a critic? Did God say it's okay for you to uh, think of yourself greater than somebody else? Tell me, tell me the truth. Tell me what's the truth of this. How do I please my father? By doing the things that my father wants me to do, regardless of my conscience, regardless of me wanting to please myself. And when I do that, I'm learning the character of my father. So it's an important point that we need to understand. 
Because of our fallen nature, we don't need anyone to teach us how to sin. But we do need the scriptures to teach us how to be righteous. As the Bible teaches in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now this doesn't mean there are no decent people in the world. It doesn't mean we all tend to sin because we're selfish at the core. The psalmist understands this and wants God to teach him to be righteous. So he asked God to illuminate his mind. Ah, oh, Lord, turn the light on in here. My mind is dark because my conscience is bad. Turn the light on. Get around it. So when I read your word and you are illuminating my mind, I know that what you illuminate my mind with is pleasing to you. You see, we don't ask. The Bible tells us if you ask not, what? Receive not. Receive not. So it's a very important point. Illuminate my mind, God. Illuminate me. Turn the light on. Turn the light on that I may see in this darkness. Do you know how many decisions you make in the dark toward your fellow man? The critic stays in the dark room, always criticizing. Do you know where we get it from? Ah, let me, let me tell you the greatest teacher. Turn on TV and listen to the politics. They'll teach you how to be the critic of critics. It is a sinful, you just will be listening to the devil himself because God hates that. And we are all falling into that trap. Now wait a minute before you start thinking that I'm just criticizing anybody that's watching TV. I'm going to tell you again, let's watch gun smoke. There ain't no cursing in it. Right? Right? Can you tell me anything wrong you truly see? Do you think God would be pleased to sit down and watch gun smoke? They drink and liquor and, and they criticize. Old innocent gun smoke. That preacher, he just awful man. Well, that's sort of like your conscience. Do you see your enemy? Do you see why you need God? Do you know why you need to ask him to illuminate? Because you got a dark enemy in here. And that dark enemy is going to lead you to say, I'm not going to church. I'm not going to the picnic. No, I'm not helping the poor. No, I'm not going. No, I don't want to. If they, listen to me. I think of Ebenezer Scrooge. Do you know why I like to watch Scrooge every year? When they open up that coat and there's this little two children. And what does he call them? What's the biggest enemy? The first one's ignorance. And what's the second one? I'm going to leave that with you. And do you know what happens? Because... That is the critical point. We criticize ignorance. But we have people that talk about something they don't know anything about. And that's called stupidity. <laughs> and then we criticize the stupidity. Have you ever seen a nation? I, I'm, I'm, I, I need to stop right there, man. Every, I'm going off. Here he goes, preacher down the branch. Y'all okay with me to go rabbit running? Y'all all right? I mean, my, you might not like it, but I just, I'm just going to run just a little ways down the branch and then I'll come back. I want you to take a look at every Jewish feast. Right now we're fixing to go into, I think it's this coming week or next week, the 
celebration where they go in and they have what they call booth, tabernacle. And what they'll do is they'll build booths in their backyards. And that family, every day, even when they come home from work, they go in and they have, they have their food together in that booth for God. Now, that's just one feast, the Feast of Booths. That's about to happen. And I want you to listen to me because I got a couple things and then I'm going to run back up the branch and leave you hanging. Every feast of the Jewish people that's being celebrated, there's something bad happens in Israel and the United States of America. When Roe versus Wade, and by the way, let me make sure you understand, at the Feast of Trumpets, Donald Trump made sure that he appointed Kavanaugh into the Supreme Court for a particular reason to stop abortion. And they made a great big idol at the United Nations. Hillary Clinton was supporting it. She was running. Her and Trump are running of Baal. Do you know who Baal was? All right, you, might, you might have heard of Baal, but do you know the purpose of Baal? Sacrificing the babies. So at the Feast of Trumpets, Donald Trump, they're calling in Israel Jehu. You remember who Jehu was? Jehu's the one that took old Jezebel and done what to? Throwed her out of the window. Are you getting my drift? Now, I've got some interesting things. So what happens at that particular time and now at some of the other feasts that every time that the children of Israel lit a candle in their feast, America had a wildfire running and burning the cities all across the nation. Because we've turned our back on God. Now, your preacher's working on a message for that. All of that. Interesting? If you believe like, and like what I just told you, say amen. amen. Now I'm running back up the branch. But I want you to especially do one thing. I want you to look into Israel... When you find out, because we're fixing to do the Feast of Tabernacle or Feast of Booths, they call it. Both, they call it both names. It's the same one. Then I want you to turn and see what happens in Israel. And then I want you to see what happens in God Bless America. Something will happen. It ain't missed a lick. And do you know what God's saying? I'm here. I'm doing these things. I started this nation just as I started Israel. As they celebrate, you're going to also reap what you're sowing. And these things come against us. That's a lot of reading and a lot of detail, but the truth of it is there. Okay? I don't know when I'll finish that. I just know that it's a big deal, but it's the truth. Okay? And I wouldn't tell you anything that what? It's the truth. It's happening. Okay, where am I? This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean there's no decent people in the world. It does mean we all tend to sin because we're selfish at the core. 
Now the psalmist understands this and wants God to teach him to be righteous. So he asks God to illuminate his mind so he can clearly see God's statue. Now list the four ways scripture profits us according to 2 Timothy 3.16. Read 2 Timothy 3.16, Cindy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in the righteousness. Take it. It's telling us the four ways scripture profits us according to what? Now, I mean, what does it profit us? Where is the profit? Well, the profit comes from being in the doctrine. You see, without the right doctrine, uh, let me give you an understanding. The closest thing to doctrine is uh, mathematically. So let's just say two plus two equals four. But what if you were taught from get-go that two plus two equals three? And you had that taught to you. And when you was in, uh, you were being taught that in school and all of your life, two plus two is three. And somebody says, no, two plus two is four. And you say, no, you're wrong in your doctrine. You're wrong in what you're saying. That is not what I was taught. Well, you see, that's the legalistic way that's taken place. And that is invading our churches and it's rotten in our churches. Our churches are weakening from the inside because the doctrine now is two plus two equals three. Homosexuals. I ran into, well, I had some guys from the golf course to come visit. And some of them are going to a church where they say, well, we love everybody and everybody's welcome. I said, well, that's true at our church. But I'm not. <laughs> they cannot become a member of the church unless they ask God to forgive them of their sins. It goes against our doctrine. Well, our doctrine is different. They can join the church and be a Sunday school teacher. I said, or even your pastor, right? Yeah. And you don't see nothing wrong with that? No. I said, that's why you're so blind. You're legalistic. And your legalistic thinking is two plus two equals three. Are you getting my drift? So where did they pick this up? Well, this is what might shock you. Both of the people that come to visit me were school principals. Now, if the school principals believe that and the teachers believe that, what does your children believe? Are you getting my point? I mean, all you got to do is run down the branch, take a look, what caused this up here? Well, you start beginning to see all the things and doctrine begins to Collab. Jim, you want to say something? I thought you was going to say something. One of Satan's powerful lies is God's way is not fun. The evil one wants to convince us God's command led to a dull, boring life. However, the Bible is the source of deepest delight. There is temporary pleasure of sin. Otherwise, no one would want to sin. Yet that short-lived fun gives birth to a long-term trouble and regret. Moses could have lived a princely life in Egypt, but he didn't. How does Hebrews 11.25 describe his choice? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of people. Moses had faith to choose right. Our faith... Our faith shows up in the choices that we make. Did you know that? The choices that you make let you know how strong your faith is. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not browbeating anybody. I mean, I'm not going to tell you. I missed this past Sunday, and, and I could have put God ahead of my wife, but that is not what God intended me to do. God wanted me to take care of my wife. If it would have been a falsification, it would be a different thing, but... 
God wanted me to be in church. And man, I want to tell you something. It's still laying on the table. My sermon, my everything, even my offering envelope is, is still laying there for me to get ready to come to church. But I could not come to church because of what it is. Now, what does that mean? My faith is to listen and obey God's word. And that's one of the things he said. Take care of your family. That's my responsibility. I'm the head of the house. I need to take care of my wife. Now my point I'm trying to make to you is there's choices that we make. And the choices that we make spiritually tells us how strong our faith is. You don't have to ask nobody. You want to know how strong your faith is? The decisions that you make that affects God. Now you say, <laughs> well, you know, what I do has nothing to do with anybody else. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. We're one body in Christ, and when a hand's missing, we sure can tell it. Amen? It's an important point. Jesus speaking to his disciples and us, he said, you have little faith. Peter constantly wanted Jesus to follow his ways, and we do the same thing. Moses had faith to obey God, and this is illustrated in the life that he lived. He forsook the pleasures of Egypt just to live in the desert and come back and deliver the people from bondage. God has given to us the same opportunity to lead someone from the bondage of sin through Jesus Christ. That's what he wants us to do. That's the most important point. Okay? Now Psalm 1611 gives us the eternal perspective that Satan wants us to forget. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now we have to see to be a good student of God, God's word, pray for illumination. And second, Sam, you're going to have to wait till next Wednesday. Okay? Enjoying it? Everybody enjoying it? Say amen. amen. Any questions or comments? Sandy, I'm going to ask you to dismiss us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for the opportunity to come learn more about your word, Lord. May we take it and put it in our hearts. May we ask you for understanding of that word so that our conscience will be good and know that we've done what is pleasing to you. Lord, you are so wonderful, and you do so much for us. If only we could take the time to see all the many blessings that you do bestow upon us. Lord, we have many on our prayer list, and we ask, Lord, for your will and way in each situation. And Lord, for our pastor, we, of course, ask for healing and for knowledge good knowledge of the doctors. But more than that, Lord, we ask that he trusts you, Lord, that he has no fear, and that he has joy in your word and living in your presence. Now, Lord, just be with us as we go to our uh, homes and be back at the appointed time. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all the many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.